So, um, why do you think we should read the Bhagavad Gita? Why is the Bhagavad Gita important for us to read? You can either post in the chat or you can unmute yourself and we can discuss. Sri Krishna is known as Jagat Guru. Yeah. Yes. So the philosophy that he has propounded and the facts of life, uh, life after death, uh, what is life all about? What happens after death? What this world, this universe comprises? We ought to know. And it is straight from God's mouth, right? Mm. And if we learn, then we can make this human life worthwhile. We understand the purpose of our human birth and we understand how we can free ourselves from the cycle of birth and death and attain moksha. So at least my purpose was that to understand why I'm born, why yes. this human life. Very good. Anybody else? Thank you. Naresh Prabhu, if you have something to say. Uh, yes, Mataji. Yeah. Uh, we need to read Bhagavad Gita just because it is a manual for human being okay. and also uh, we can get liberation. Apart from that, it is liberation is just a small process, mm. but we can achieve Krishna by reading Bhagavad Gita, by chanting Hare Krishna Mahamantra, by reading by, by Bhagavatam. We can achieve Krishna. That is a, a end of uh, birth, uh, like a birth cycle. I think so, Mataji. Very good. Anyone else? Why should we read the Bhagavad Gita? And uh, actually, the question should have been, why should we read the Bhagavad Gita every day, not once in, uh, once in a while? Why should we read the Bhagavad Gita every day, actually? Every day we should be reading. Hare Krishna. What I feel is that Bhagavad Gita is a treasure of knowledge. So whenever you read, every time you get a new thing to learn. And as a, as we are Sanatani, so it is our duty to read about uh, the scriptures, what the, the, our great saints have uh, given to us. So we will uh, have a proper knowledge about how to love God, how to serve Lord in a better way, according to the scriptures. Mm. This is also the way why we have to learn Bhagavad Gita. This Very is also good. Anyone else? Uh, Mataji, as you as you told that we need to read Bhagavad Gita every day because the Maya is so powerful that it will attack on it will attack ah. on brain every day. So we the nail on come the head. over that. Yeah, to come over that we need to read Bhagavad Gita so that the Maya will uh, go from us. We can become Krishna devotee. Then Maya will not uh, every day Maya. Every day Maya attacks on us. So to overcome that, we need to read Bhagavad Gita. I think so, Mataji. No, excellent point. Excellent point. See, Maya attacks us when we think we are strong and Maya attacks us when we, are, when we know we are weak also. So to guard against Maya Devi all the time. Yes, I agree with you that we have to read the Bhagavad Gita every day because otherwise, at any moment, she can uh, throw the net of illusion on us and we can be very lost very quickly. So, all of you are right. The Bhagavad Gita is considered to be our life's manual, actually. How do we operate this body? And when we use the word body, we're inclu including the senses, mind and intelligence here. How to handle difficult situations? How to avoid the trap of Maya Devi. Uh, yes, these are all um, reasons why we should read the Bhagavad Gita every day. I, I have one uh, request, Mataji. Mm -hmm. Just need your guidance because every time that I've tried to read Bhagavad Gita, na, mm -hmm. I have not managed to read it because I don't know. I find it very difficult or whatever. So I thought maybe I should understand it from some authority. Then it will make life easy for me to go through it. So one question what I have is, uh, will you also guide us in telling us every day what all verses we should read, like how we go about it, first five in a sequence or uh, anytime after the 18th day session also, if you tell us, fine, yeah? Mm -hmm. So it will be a, a kind of a barometer for me also, like how to follow and how to practice it, practice reading it and imbibing it in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. And uh, one of the reasons why we are having daily shloka classes is to exactly do that. Not all of us have 
uh, ample amount of time to read the Bhagavad Gita. Some of us may be able to spare, say, 20 minutes. Some of us may be less than that. Some of us, maybe we can spare an hour, an hour and a half to do reading every day. So when you have such huge variations, then what's the best way to encourage everybody to at least have a, um, you know, to ha at least have a short class every day so that at least something is going in, you know, uh, consciously or subconsciously, you're absorbing something. Even the subconscious matters uh, when we read the Bhagavad Gita or when we chant or uh, when we attend classes. How things are influencing your subconsciousness also matters. You know, even though you may not be 100% paying attention to the class as and when that class is actually going on. Because it's impossible for a human being to be so highly focused, um, you know, in um, for a long, long period of time, you know. <clears throat> Uh, so, the Bhagavad Gita has 700 verses that are split into 18 chapters. And over these 18 chapters, our uh, founder Acharya, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada, has written detailed explanations for each of the shlokas. So, if you read the book that says Bhagavad Gita as it is, <clears throat> so you're looking at approximately 1,000 pages that you need to read. But the beauty of, about the Bhagavad Gita, it is, it is ever fresh. You can always get something new out of it. And it happens even to the most well-read of devotees of the scriptures. So I can also attest to it because, uh, you know, by now I would have read the Bhagavad Gita probably eight or nine times. But sometimes when I pick up the book and read a particular shloka, I wonder, how come I don't remember this particular shloka? Uh, I had overlooked it or I couldn't remember the context. So there is always something fresh for you. And the beauty about reading the Bhagavad Gita is, you know, sometimes you are carrying questions in your head. Sometimes momentarily you may be thinking about something. And when you open the book, you'll get your answer. It has happened to me so many times. I just out of curiosity, I may have a question and then suddenly I will just randomly open a page and I'll find the answer. Sometimes there is some real challenge in my personal life and I'm wondering, you know, what should be my response or reaction? And I'll open the scriptures and I'll find the answer. I'll be listening to a lecture and I'll find the answer. So that's the real beauty about uh, really diving into the scriptures is that, uh, you know, uh, just give me one second. I forgot to do something here. Yeah. So it, it is ever fresh in that sense. You can always get something out of it and it will never disappoint you. That's the one thing is the scriptures don't disappoint you. Human beings disappoint you, circumstances disappoint you. The scriptures will never disappoint you. They never let you down. They always have answers to your questions. So Prabhupada said, you know, that if we remember even just one word or one verse or even one line of that verse, then our entire life can become very perfect. Sometimes uh, we are very fond of particular verses because it appeals to us so much, you know, uh, because it, it's so meaningful to us in our personal life. But you'll realize the more you get absorbed in the Bhagavad Gita, the more you feel connected to Krishna. You feel like as if the Lord is personally speaking to you. Although he's not here physically in front of you. Of course, he's there within you as the Paramatma. And the last point I want to make about the importance of reading the scriptures every day is that the Lord is protecting you when you read the scriptures. Because the Lord knows your intent. 
if your intent is pure and if you genuinely want to improve yourself, the Lord will help you in so many ways. See, at the end of the day, what are we fighting? Actually, if we speak the truth, we are fighting ourselves. We are fighting our anger. We are fighting our lust. We are fighting our greed. We are fighting anxiety. We are fighting our fear. All of this, these emotions that are in us, that prevent us or you know, inhibit us from leading a normal, happy, energetic, positive life. That, these things we do to ourselves, actually. So <clears throat> what happens when you read the Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam or the scriptures every day or come and recite the shlokas every day, the cleansing process begins. What is being cleansed? What is actually being cleansed is all your anarthas, actually. Of course, chanting is part of that formula. You know, chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is part of that formula. Reading the scriptures is part of that formula. Serving the deities in the temple in some way to the, to the uh, limit or capacity that we have is part of that formula. Changing your diet is part of that formula. Uh, associating with other like-minded individuals who are also keen on becoming better human beings, to be more compassionate, uh, to forgive oneself, to be compassionate with oneself, so that we can also exhibit that same love and compassion for other living entities, not just human beings, all living entities. So the benefit of reading scriptures is that it helps you cleanse it's a deep cleansing. So the beauty of the Bhagavad Gita is that, and you may not be aware of this, I don't know how many of you have read the Bhagavatam. The beauty of our scriptures is that everything is in question and answer format. The entire Bhagavad Gita is question and answer session only. Arjuna asks questions, Krishna will answer. Then Arjuna has doubts, he'll ask more questions, Krishna will clarify. Isn't that the best way to learn? Is by asking questions, right? When you have a doubt, you want to reach out to somebody and ask the question. Isn't that a natural way of learning? You will not find this in the Bible, you will not find this in the Quran, but you find it in our scriptures. So this demonstrates that these scriptures are meant for human beings who have a very high level of intelligence. They are able to see things happening around them and ask the relevant questions. So this entire Q&A format that happens in Bhagavad Gita is happening between the Guru and Shishya. And who is playing the role of Guru here? Lord Krishna. Who is playing the role of uh, student here? Arjuna. So the Q&A format actually is the best way to learn. Best way to ask questions in a very humble way, in a very submissive way of the Guru. So to one of you who made a, a comment earlier, to read the Bhagavad Gita by oneself is very difficult. The risk is you may interpret certain things and walk away with a completely different understanding than, than what Lord Krishna intended. So that is the danger of reading scriptures on our own. So all scriptures must be read under the guidance of Guru. That is our parampara. This is so strong in our Vedic culture. Always we study under the guidance of Guru. For any other mundane subject matters, we go to school and learn so many things. Teachers who have to qualify themselves after studying for 20, 30 or whatever, 20, 25 years, they have to get a particular certificate and only then they are allowed to teach. So similarly, 
you have to approach gurus who are self realized so for us the preeminent guru for us in the kali yuga is our founder acharya shila prabhupad his purports in these books are simply sublime so it's like shila prabhupad is actually directly talking to you and answering your questions while you are reading his commentary on these shlokas so with that we will go to what does a preeminent acharya say about the bhagavad gita so today's chapter is titled arjuna vishad yoga this is the sanskrit title of the chapter arjuna vishad yoga vishad means distress or lamentation this entire chapter i wouldn't say entire chapter a significant portion of the chapter is arjuna complaining and protesting and giving all kinds of reasons why he should not fight so you come to the battlefield and then you make a decision actually i don't want to fight and we'll go over those reasons <clears throat> so arjuna vishada yoga means the lamentation of arjuna the distress of arjuna on the battlefield and why is he distressed we will talk about that also so let's offer our obeisances to his divine grace ac bhakti vedanta swami shila prabhupad shila prabhupad ki jai so in today's chapter we are going to briefly talk about the scenario in which the bhagavad gita is being spoken how in the first chapter itself the divinity of the lord is established when the word bhagavan is used and what becomes clear in the very first shloka is although the very first shloka is actually spoken by dhritarashtra and that's the only verse that he speaks in the entire bhagavad gita he he asks a question and in response to that question sanjaya begins to narrate what is happening on the battlefield how the lord is always protecting his devotees and we learn with what are the miseries of life that we ourselves undergo and how can we tackle it handle it in the best way we can you know we are not experts at solving psychological issues uh, emotional melodramas that happens in relationships because we are we have such a vested interest in things we are not able to separate ourselves from the problem sometimes you can't solve the problem unless you learn to distance yourself from the problem so if you put a little bit of a distance between you and the problem you can see the problem clearly and then you are able to target and address and take steps to address that particular problem yeah so i said we will begin by looking at one of the greatest acharyas he has written seven verses that are called the gita mahatmya so this is adi shankaracharya who writes seven verses about the importance of the bhagavad gita and reading the bhagavad gita every day i'm not going to go over the seven verses i will look at two verses verse 3 and verse 7 so let's look at verse 3 maline mochanam pumsham jalasnanam dine dine ீதாம்ரதஸ்நானம்சாரமலநாசனம்சோடசாதிசங்கராச்சாரியாயிட்டிங்ரதவசீங்கிளன்ஸ்ஃபெல்ஃபெய்லிபாத்தீவன்
What can help us keep it pristine, clean? You know, we not only take care of our body, we also take care of our clothes. It has to be, you know, we like to go, go out well-dressed. But what about the deeper things that actually is going to make a difference in your life? The machine that we are occupying is not just this physical body, right? We have this subtle body called the mind, intelligence, and ego. How are we going to, how are we supposed to keep that clean? So that it is performing at an optimal level. So for that, Shankaracharya is saying, Shripad Shankaracharya is saying, for that, we have to bathe in the Bhagavad Gita every day. If you bathe in the Bhagavad Gita every day, the chances of all of the dirt that you've accumulated from past lives and your present life diminishes. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you will become a saint tomorrow. It just means you will be able to live a positive, high energy, fulfilling, compassionate, loving life. At the end of the day, that's what we want. We want to be happy. How can you be happy if your subtle body is filled with filth? Right? How can you operate the machinery with only one part of the machinery that is being taken care of, which is your physical body? So this is the other relevant fact of the Bhagavad Gita where I was saying at the end of the day, the cleansing process begins when you reach out to the scriptures every day. Because you need a clear mind to make decisions when, especially if you come across tough situations. How can you think clearly? How can you separate fact from fiction? How can you make the right decisions? Decisions that help you and help others. You know, sometimes when we get hurt by others, especially in relationships when you experience emotional pain, it becomes very difficult to forgive the other person. And as long as we are not able to forgive the other person, we carry that hurt within us for the rest of our lives. And it is a huge burden. And it prevents you over a period of time it prevents you from living an exuberant life. You become morose, you become depressed. You know, why me questions come up at this time. So one importance and one relevance of the Bhagavad Gita, Adi Shankaracharya is saying, the dirt that we have accumulated. So remember, when you change bodies, your mind, intelligence, and ego goes with you, which means your past memories, your past intelligence, everything is going with you. So it's not like you have given up the physical body, but you've not given up the subtle body. So there is immense amount of past karmas, past, what we call it, vasanas, tendencies, habits that we're carrying forward with us. And the only way to cleanse it is scriptures. Reading the scriptures, meditation, etc. So if you go to the last verse, what Adi Shankaracharya is saying, Ekam Shastram Devaki Putra Geetam Eko Devo Devaki Putra Eva Eko Mantrastasya Namani Yani Karma Pyekam Tasya Devasya Seva what does the shloka mean? These are the seven verses that are called the Gita Mahatmya. Shankaracharya is saying, if at all one has to study, if at all you have to choose between all the holy scriptures, which scripture will you pick up? He is saying, pick up the Bhagavad Gita. If you had a choice where you are only allowed to take one scripture and one scripture alone, you know, great personalities have, have said, you know, uh, if you were stranded on an island, what would you take with you if you were allowed to take only one thing? And different people have given 
different answers. I know some great personalities who have said no. We will only take the Bhagavad Gita. So if at all we need to read one Shastra on a daily basis, because remember, we have to take a bath every day, then your choice should be the Bhagavad Gita. And then Shankaracharya is saying, if at all you have to worship Bhagavan, which Bhagavan would you worship? He is saying, please worship Lord Krishna. He is saying, Eko Devo Devaki Putra Eva. Worship Lord Vishnu, worship Lord Krishna. If at all you have to chant one mantra and one mantra alone, you don't have the capacity to memorize any of the mantras. Adi Shankaracharya is saying, chant the holy names of Lord Krishna. That is also purifying. And if at all you have to decide, what is that one uh, act of bhakti that you want to take up and perform? He is saying, worship Lord Krishna. So we talked about deity worship. We talked about chanting. We talked about uh, reading the books. So this is that ABCD formula. So this is the importance of the Bhagavad Gita in our culture and we should take full advantage of it. So <clears throat> the Bhagavad Gita um, has 18 chapters. And uh, it is divided into three sections. The first six chapters, then chapter 7 to 12, and then 13 to 18. So the first six chapters are called the Karma Yoga portion of the Bhagavad Gita. Then the next six chapters, which is chapter 7 to 12, is called the Bhakti Yoga section of the Bhagavad Gita. And then uh, 13 to 18 is called the Jnana Yoga or Sankhya Yoga section of the Bhagavad Gita. There is another way in which the three sections are divided. So first thing is, first six chapters, Karma Yoga. Next six chapters, Bhakti Yoga. The last six chapters, Jnana Yoga. Now we're going to look at a different dissection of these 18 chapters. Remember, where in the Secrets of Gita Revealed, we said there are five topics in the Bhagavad Gita, which is Jiva, uh, sorry, Ishvara, Jivatma, Prakriti, Kala, and Karma. Again, if you break up these chapters into six, six, and six, the first six chapters are all about Jivatma. It answers the question, who am I? Only if you know who you are, you are going to know what is your roles and responsibilities. Imagine if you try to use your mobile phone as a gas lighter, will it work? You can't switch devices, right? Each device comes for a particular purpose. It's made for a particular purpose. So if you and I don't even understand who we are and what's the purpose of our life, then everything and everything and anything could be accidental. We don't want anything accidental in our life. As much as possible, we want to be deliberative based on the scriptures, not, not under the assumption that we are independent. So the first six chapters are about uh, Jeevatma. Ratna Kumari, please uh, put yourself in mute. It is uh, too much disturbance when you unmute yourself. So the first six chapters are about, who am I? The next six chapters, okay, now that you know who you are, uh, where does God fit into this picture? So the next six chapters, which is seven to 12, is who is Bhagavan or Paramatma? Who is the Supreme Lord? So the first six chapters answers the question, who are you? And we'll go into the details about who are you and the, all the other ancillary questions that get answered. 
So the second section talks about who is Bhagwan. And the third section talks about what is Prakriti. And between the first six chapters and the last six chapters, karma is covered. So under the question of who are you, automatically karma has to be covered because who are you means you are not an inanimate object, you are acting. So if you are acting, you are accumulating karma. So karma gets addressed both in the first six chapters and a little bit in detail in the last six chapters. So that means Jivatma, Paramatma, Karma and Prakriti covered. Time, as I said, time, uh, Lord Krishna talks about time in the context of creation and uh, maintenance and destruction. How often creation, maintenance and destruction happens, he talks about it probably in maybe six or seven shlokas. So, another dissection of the Bhagavad Gita is the first six chapters is all about Jivatma, the next six is about Paramatma, the final six is about Prakriti, karma gets covered along the way and so does time. You need to know who you are so that you know what is your duty and responsibility and how are you supposed to conduct yourself, right? So that is important. So in our culture, we are all very familiar with the word Charanamrit. What does the word Charanamrit mean? Does anybody know? What is Charanamrit? If you go to the temple, we take it. What is Charanamrit? Touching the feet of Bhagwan Mataji. Huh. What do you, at least in South India, we call it, call it Tirta, right? That we take a sip. Yeah. Huh? Yes, Mataji. In North India also, do you get it? I know it's very prevalent in South India. In the te temple to North India, I don't know if it is that prevalent. Yes? Yeah, Mataji. Okay. So that Sharanam Rith, do you know what that water is? Sometimes you'll get two different types of water. One is just like water. The other one has milk and <coughs> yogurt Abhishekam and honey. What they did for the deities, Mataji. Huh? Abhishekam, what they did do for the deities. Yes, for the deities. When the deities are bathed every day, that water is collected and distributed as Charanamrit. So this Charanamrit is considered to be holy water. It has touched the body of Krishna. So... It's very rare for us to get this kind of charanamrit. So the mood with which one accepts the charanamrit should be uh, with a great deal of uh, humility and thankfulness and gratitude that the Lord has allowed us to take a sip of something that has touched his body. So there's another word that is called kathamrit. You know, charanamrit also means anything that emanates from the lotus feet of the Lord. And we all know that the river Ganges originates from one of the big toes of Lord Vishnu in the spiritual world. It flows all the way through the spiritual world and comes to the material world. So you are only seeing the Ganges as what is visible in Bharata Varsha. But if you read the scriptures, you'll understand that the Ganges also is flowing. It, it goes by different names in the upper planetary systems, it goes by different names. The same Ganges is flowing in the upper planetary systems also. So the opportunity for all of us to go and take a dip in the Ganges is not uh, that wide. But it is said, our Shastra say, if with, with, if with great sincerity, if we take a dip, in the water of the Ganges, with sincerity, it wipes out all of our previous karmas. But then you will come out and do the same thing again. So how many times will you go and take a dip? So we need to figure out how to put a stop to the cycle of karmic reactions. So there is Charanamrit. Not all of us are fortunate enough to stay beside the Ganges every day where we can go and take a bath in the Ganges every day. 
Then there's another word that's called Khatamrit. Khatamrit means you are hearing from Krishna or you're hearing about Krishna. This anybody can do anytime just by attending classes. So which means taking the bath in the Ganges is far more rare than just listening to the Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam. It's easy, especially today in the digital culture. So let's look at the slides for the day now. So every chapter will have an acronym. So today's acronym is doubt. So here we are going to see what is the doubt that is plaguing both Dhritarashtra and Duryodhana. There are signs when you read the shlokas that suggest that the Kauravas are going to lose. The uncertainty of Arjuna's confusion. The bewilderment that Arjuna experiences as to what is the right thing to do in a difficult situation. And the, the turning point is when he actually decides to surrender to Krishna and say, I actually don't know what, what to do in this situation. You have to help me. Yeah. So doubt is the acronym for it. So please recite after me. Dhritarashtra Uvacha. Dhritarashtra Uvacha. Atma Kshetre Kuru Kshetre. Dharam Kshetre Kuru Kshetre. Samaveta Yutsavaha. Mamaka Pandavas Kimakurvata Sanjaya The Trasha said, O Sanjaya, after my sons and the sons of uh, Niharika Mataji, I think there's a big lag from your uh, phone. There's a little bit of delay, I think. Dhritarashtra said, O Sanjaya, after my sons and the sons of Pandu assembled in the place of pilgrimage at Purukshetra, desiring to fight, what did they do? Now just think about it. Dhritarashtra knows that his sons are getting ready to do battle. He has been encouraging this all along. He is sitting in his palace. He is blind. Sanjaya has the benediction from his guru, Vyasadeva, of seeing and hearing things that are happening elsewhere. So Sanjaya has the benedic benediction of doing live telecast. Dhritarashtra knows what is about to happen. So why would he ask an obvious question like this? Oh, Sanjaya, after my sons and the sons of Pandu assembled in the place of pilgrimage, desiring to fight, what did they do? Obviously, they are going to fight. Why is he asking a silly question like this? To really understand this, we have to go deeper. This indicates fear. So let's look at the words that he himself has used. Dharma Kshetre. This is a holy land on which they are getting ready to fight. And Dhritarashtra is fearful. This is a holy land and the virtuous will be victorious. And he knows in his heart that the virtuous are the Pandavas. So sometimes when you are fearful and afraid and anxious about things, they come out in the form of a question. Then he uses the word Kshetre. Kshetre means field. You know, any farmer who plants a crop has to work hard to remove the weeds because whatever nutrients he is supplying to the crops, 
will also feed the weeds is it not when you are growing a plant and you are pouring water and putting manure and all of these nice bio degradable substances that are natural and help the plants grow it is also going to help the weeds grow so it is the gardener's duty to deweed constantly because the same nutrient is helping both things grow both what you want to grow and what you don't want to grow is also growing so who is the farmer here the father of dharma krishna since krishna is present on this battlefield he is going to do a major deweeding so that's the deeper me meaning behind the word kshetre the father of dharma himself is on the battlefield there must be a reason he is there he's come to remove the weeds who are the weeds the kauravas so dharma kshetre kurukshetre so which is the dharma kshetre it is this kurukshetra land samaveta yuyutsavah desiring to fight you you savaha means everybody is anxious to fight mama kaaf pandavas chaiva he saying my sons and the pandavas so immediately he is brought separation are the pandavas not his own nephews so division within the family i my and somebody else kim akurvata samjaya the other thing that dhritarashtra was anxious about is because this is the holy land is it possible that his sons will get influenced by being present on a holy land and what if they just give up what if they give up what if they walk away because suddenly they are on holy land father of dharma is standing there will they be influenced by these auspicious and holy aspects will they just give up everything and walk away and then he has hope also his hope is maybe just maybe 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 the pandavas will get influenced and they will give up they'll say this fight is not worth it we shouldn't kill each other like this let the kauravas keep the land we will walk away so you see conflicting emotions running through dhritarashtra's mind and hence this question what did they do so he's doubtful he's fearful he's expressed his partiality so we are now going to come to duryodhana's mindset duryodhana is considered to be an expert in rajaniti rajaniti means politics the art of diplomacy and uh, the greatest politicians know how to construct words in sentences that you that utterly confuse you are they for you or are they against you you are not able to figure out that is how clever duryodhana was and we'll come to what he says here in a minute but then covering uh, that external diplomacy is actually covering a deep inner fear and what is that fear we'll find out so <clears throat> we already covered this that they are on the holy land and ritrashtra is not sure how this holy land is going to influence his sons or he's hoping it will influence the pandavas to just walk away will his sons compromise will lord krishna ultimately put his foot down as the father of dharma and establish the law of the land so these are conflicting thoughts for dhritarashtra yes he is considering only his own sons and not the pandavas this whole mentality of i me mine which really corrupts us so what is the lesson for us here that no matter how much you may have in terms of wealth or knowledge or intelligence or beauty fame nothing 
can stop you from experiencing fear unless you are connected to the divine. So fear stems from not being connected with the divine. Once you've accumulated a lot of things, you experience fear that you're going to lose it. So for that, you will purchase insurance. If I bought a house, I've paid one crores. Now I'm afraid if that house collapses in a in an earthquake or something, I better buy insurance. So like this, we purchase a car. I am afraid my the risk of getting into an accident is high. Then I purchase insurance for that. I'm afraid I will give up my life. I need to take care of my family. So I purchase life insurance. So there is no guarantee. So our life is beset with fear. We are, fear, we are fearful of le le losing our loved ones. We are fearful of losing our jobs. We are fearful of losing the money that we have saved. We are fearful of diseases. We are fearful of wars happening. There is no guarantee. No matter what you do, zero guarantee that you'll be able to keep everything. So the other <clears throat> problem stems from when you exhibit selfish tendencies, where you only care about you and yourself and your family's success. And of course, this may then slowly grow over your family's success, then your society's success, then your nation's success, like that. But ultimately, we are all selfish. We operate with the selfish agenda. So when every decision that you make is based on selfishness, then yes, again, you have to deal with fear, anxiety, disappointment. You don't have a choice. Because you're only thinking about you and your gains or your losses. So let's look at Duryodhana's diplomacy. So Sanjaya says that Duryodhana has walked over to Dronacharya. And he begins to speak. So in the first chapter, you will hear Duryodhana speak. After that, he will not speak after that. So that there are four personalities that speak in the Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna, Arjuna, Duryodhana, Sanjaya, and Dhritarashtra. Five. So <clears throat> what is the first thing Duryodhana does? Actually, let's look at the shlokas. Hmm? It's very interesting. Look at the shloka three. What is Duryodhana? This is Duryodhana speaking. So Sanjaya says in shloka two, O king, after looking over the army arranged in military formation by the sons of Pandu, King Duryodhana went to his teacher. The battle has not been won yet, but Sanjay is using the term king to address Duryodhana. Went to his teacher and spoke the following words. And what is Duryodhana saying? Oh, my teacher, behold the great army of the sons of Pandu, so expertly arranged by your intelligent disciple, the son of Drupada. This is... Uh, Rajaniti being practiced, diplomacy being practiced. There's a background story to this. So what happens is Dronacharya and Drupada, when they were very young children, they went to the same school. They were best of friends. Now, Dronacharya was the son of a poor Brahmana, whereas Drupada was a prince the son of a king. But somehow, they established a very strong friendship when they were in school as young boys. And Drupada, out of love for his friend Dronacharya, tells him, when I grow up to be the king, I will give you 50% of my kingdom. I don't like to see that you are living a life of poverty. So this statement is made by Drupada to Dronacharya when they were children. So meantime, Dronacharya, they've left school. He's gotten married. He has a young son. Uh, 
He's a Brahmana, he's leading a very poor life, a simple life, an austere life. And one day his son comes crying home and he asks his son, why are you crying? And his son tells him, the children in the school are teasing me, saying that I don't know what milk is. So Dronacharya was so poor that he didn't even have a cow. So his wife would mix wheat with water, atta with water, make it really liquidy, give it to the son and tell him this is milk. So the students found this out and started teasing Dronacharya's son saying, he's such a poor person, he doesn't even know what milk is. So Dronacharya feeling the pain of his young son, this remembers that Drupada had made this promise. I will give you 50% of my kingdom. But of course, Dronacharya is not interested in 50% of the kingdom. So he goes to Drupada. Drupada is now the king. And he tells him, my dear Drupada, and I am so poverty stricken. And you are the king. Can you give me at least a cow that I can keep and take care of my family? And Drupada by now has forgotten what all he has told Dronacharya. He's a king now after all. So he insults Dronacharya and he says, you and I are not equals. Don't even talk about our friendship. Who are you and who am I? Our status in life is completely changed. We are from different levels of society. Just get out of here. So like this, Drupada insults Dronacharya. And when Dronacharya comes back, he tells about this incident to the Kauravas and the Pandavas. And the Kauravas immediately say, uh, Gurudev, you've been insulted. We will catch this Drupada and teach him a lesson. So Duryodhana with his brothers, they go for a fight with Drupada. They get soundly defeated. They cannot capture Drupada. They come back. So seeing that the, they have lost, the Pandavas tell their guru, we will go take care of business now. So the Pandavas go, they defeat Drupada, they tie up Drupada and they bring him and throw him at the feet of Dronacharya and say, here he is, do what you wish. And Dronacharya says, I will take 50% of the kingdom, but he releases Drupada. So Drupada, being vengeful, performs a great yajna. And from that yajna come two children, Drishtadyumna and Draupadi. Now, because Dronacharya was a preeminent teacher in the art of warfare, Drupada sends his son Drishtadyumna to Dronacharya to learn the art of the warfare, knowing fully well that once his son learns the art of warfare, he is going to kill Dronacharya. But the magnanimity of a Brahmana is such that if any student comes knocking on the door, you do not say no. You accept that student. So although Dronacharya knew that Drupada's son was going to be the cause of his own death, he still teaches the art of warfare to Drishtadyumna. And therefore now you understand why Duryodhana is making this statement. He is goading his guru. Oh my teacher, behold the great army of the sons of Pandu, so expertly arranged by your intelligent disciple the son of Drupada. So his mood was to critique his own guru saying, look, you trained that Drishtadyumna. He's not on our side. He's on the other side. So here, from here on out, what uh, Duryodhana will do is he will start glorifying the other side. 
he will talk about the greatness of Arjuna, Bhima, uh, <clears throat> and all of the other fighters on the Pandava side. And then as if he has overdone it, he will start praising his own side. He will start praising Dronacharya, thinking, okay, in case I've insulted you a little too much by that statement, let me also let you know that I consider you to be a great person. But Duryodhana also had a doubt. He had doubts. Dronacharya's favorite disciple was Arjuna. Will he be lenient or will he really fight for the Gurus? So that's one doubt Duryodhana had. The other thing is, it is said that Bhishma Dev was 192 years old on the battlefield. And he wasn't sure if uh, Bhishma Dev could handle the battle, which was a preposterous thing to think. So he actually makes a statement in one of the shlokas. He says, I want everybody to give your full support to Bhishma Dev. So this is his diplomatic nature. So he's pointing out Dronacharya's mistake. He has glorified the warriors on both sides. He demonstrates that he is envious of Bhima's strength. And then he compares Bhima to Bhishma and concludes by saying everybody should support Bhishma. He's not sure if this old man on the battlefield can really do his job. He knows even Bhishma has a soft spot for the Pandavas. So he's filled with doubts, inner fear. Are you, is Bhishma Dev really going to fight on our behalf? Is Dronacharya going to really fight on our behalf? Because they both love the Pandavas so much. And then there are shlokas throughout the first chapter that indicate that the Kauravas are going to lose. The very first shloka is Dharma Kshetre, Kurukshetre. The battle is being fought on holy land. Then the fact that Krishna is personally present as the father of Dharma, that also confirms that the Pandavas will be victorious. And the first person to blow the conch shell on the battlefield is Bhishma Dev. After Bhishma Dev blows the conch shell, then the Pandavas start blowing their conch shell, including Lord Krishna. At that time, Sanjaya, uses the word divyam. He talks about the transcendental nature of the conscience of the Pandavas and Krishna. He doesn't use the word divyam when Bhishma Dev is blowing that conscience. Although Bhishma Dev is one of the 12 great Mahajans. So he re reserves the word divyam for the, to explain or describe the Pandavas conscience. The presence of Hanuman on the flag of Arjuna. There's a short story behind this. When the Pandavas were in Manavas, uh, they were somewhere near the Alkananda River and Draupadi sees a beautiful thousand petal lotus in the river. And she asks Bhima, I want some more of those flowers. Can you get me some more? And Bhima, ever happy to please his wife, takes off on top of the mountains. They are in Badrikashram. He goes up the mountains and on the way, he uproots trees and plants, trying to find out uh, where these lotuses would be. So on the path, he comes across a very old monkey. I'm sure most of you have read this in some comic book somewhere. An <laughs> old monkey laying on the path. And he very respectfully asked the monkey to move. The monkey apparently couldn't hear. So he asks a couple of times. Then he becomes really angry and he says, you better move or I will take care of you right here and now. And that old monkey tells him, why don't you just move my tail and cross over? What's the big deal? Stop making a fuss. So Bhima tries to move the tail of the monkey and he's not able to. And he's shocked. This monkey looks old, so frail. I'm not even able to move the tail of this monkey. And he realizes this is no ordinary personality. So he asks this personality, who are you? 
and this personality says, I am the son of Vayu. And that, of course, was Hanuman. And Hanuman recognizes Bhima and he says, you are my brother. At that time, Bhima asked Hanuman, look, after this, uh, one of us, we are going to get into a battle. We would love to have your support on, your, on our side. Won't you come and fight with us? And Hanuman says, it is inappropriate for me to fight in this battle because I am from a completely different yuga. I am from the Teta Yuga. You are all in the Dwapar Yuga. He says it is unethical for me to fight in a battle, in a Yuga in which I didn't uh, make my appearance. But he tells uh, Bhima, I will support you. I will give you moral support. So wherever I am, I have my good wishes and blessings and moral support are with you. And that is why Hanuman's image is on the flag on top of Arjuna's chariot. And there are references to Lakshmi Devi and how actually Agni Dev uh, benedicts this specific chariot to Arjuna. There's a pastime behind that also, but we will not go over it today, maybe some other time. How Arjuna actually ended up getting the chariot. So as the conch shells are being blown, there is a particular shloka. Sago shodhartarashtranam hridaya nivyadarayat nabhascha pratidin chaiva tumulo bhyanunadayan. Which means that when the Pandavas blew their conch shells along with Lord Krishna, it shattered the courage, the hearts of all the gurus. It set fear in their hearts that they are about to lose their lives on this battlefield. So wherever Krishna is, he's there for his devotees. So if we have even a little bit of faith in Krishna, you can be fearless. So as I said, fearlessness can only come if you're connected to the divine. It's very difficult to lead a fearless life I mean, externally, you may be showing some bombastic behavior and aggressive behavior, but that is just covering up your inner fear. But to be truly fearless and bold, at some level, one has to be connected to spirituality. So this is very important. If we want to lead a fearless life, how do we go about doing it? We have to connect with the Supreme. So then begins the section where Arjuna is hesitating to fight. So let's read the shloka. Tan samikshya sakaunte yaha sarvan bandhuna vastitan kripaya paraya vishto vishidan nidam abravita. When the son of Kunti, Arjuna, saw all these different grades, this happens after they have blown the conscience. So all these different grades of friends and relatives, he became overwhelmed with compassion and spoke thus. So what does Arjuna say? Drishtvemam svajanam krishna yuyutsum samupasthitam sidanti mamagatrani mukhancha parishushyati Arjuna saying, my dear Krishna, Seeing my friends and relatives present before me in such a fighting spirit, I feel the limbs of my body quivering and my mouth drying up. So Arjuna had asked Krishna, you take the chariot to the middle of the battlefield because I want to see who has come here to fight. Who are these scoundrels who have come here to fight this war? And the minute he sees Bhishma and Dronacharya and all of his relatives, doubts start creeping in the mind. And he says, I'm, I'm not feeling good about this. I'm feeling nervous. Mukhancha parishushyati, even my mouth is drying up. Arjuna is a great warrior. He's not a, he's not an ordinary person. 
Yet an extraordinary warrior is ex suddenly experiencing all of these symptoms. <clears throat> of course, he goes through a litany of reasons as to why he should not fight. We will look at that. But at the end, he has to take shelter of Lord Krishna because he was completely confused about his duty and responsibilities. So when does one get confused? When you forget your identity. When you don't know who you are and you don't know what your role and responsibility is. Which is why the very first six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita primarily address our spiritual identity and the fact that as spiritual beings, we have a relationship, an eternal relationship with the Supreme. So Arjuna is experiencing what we call amnesia, forgetfulness. He's forgotten who he is. So he's experiencing all these symptoms. His limbs are quivering. His mouth is drying up. He says, my mind is reeling. He says, my skin is burning. He tells Krishna, Krishna, my hair is standing on it. I'm not able to stand. My entire body is trembling. And he says, my bow is slipping away from my hands. So he's exhibiting his helplessness. He's experiencing symptoms that he has never experienced on a battlefield before. Why? Because his own family members are on the other side. So for Arjuna, the conflict, the internal conflict that he's experiencing is, am I supposed to protect my family or am I supposed to protect dharma? If I protect dharma, I have to kill my family. If I protect my family, I have to give up on my dharma. So his conflict is between kula dharma and kshatriya dharma. Kula dharma means protecting your family. Kshatriya dharma means as a king, he is supposed to provide good governance, a good society with proper rules, regulations, so that people can live lead a peaceful life. So it's a genuine conflict. He's not given silly little excuses. Although Krishna will scold him in chapter two for giving all these reasons. But Arjuna is genuinely in anguish. Why should I kill my own family just so that I can become a king? If they are so greedy, if they are so unscrupulous, let them have it. That's what he says. So Arjuna gives the following reasons. One, he says, hey, Krishna, how can you expect me to kill my own guru? They are worthy of my worship. How can you expect me to kill Bhishma Pitamaha? He has protected us. He is worthy of my worship. And after killing all of them, how can you expect me to enjoy the kingdom? What is left to enjoy after I've destroyed all my family? After so much bloodshed, how can I be happy and peaceful and just act, pretend like nothing ever happened and, uh, you know, continue to rule? And then he has one more doubt. After killing my own family members, who will take up all of that sin of killing on the battlefield? I have to face the consequences of so much killing. And after killing all of these men, all the women will be left without their husbands and therein families will be destroyed. The women will be taken advantage of. Unwanted children will come out of it because they will be forced to associate with men who take advantage of them knowing that they are vulnerable. And then he says, if I kill all these men, who will perform the shraddha ceremony for our forefathers on their side? Pindadan will stop, he says. 
if we kill all the elders who will teach our youngsters family tradition he says even that will stop so like this one after the other arjuna gives many reasons why really he should just walk away he says i am willing to give up my kshatriya i am ready to become a sanyasi i am ready to go into the forest this jhanjhat is not for me so arjuna is genuinely experiencing this anxious conflict ridden emotions turmoil that he is undergoing hence the first chapter is titled arjuna vishada yoga yoga he is united with his compassion with his depression with his anxiety so in our life we have to learn two types of tolerance actually we use one more than the other we tend to emotionally tolerate situations because of our attachment to individuals or family or things yes it is necessary to tolerate to a certain extent to keep the family together etc etc but really what we should be practicing is spiritual tolerance what is spiritual tolerance we must always adhere to dharmic principles you know i was talking to um one of the devotees who's attending our classes and uh, she was just talking about an incident within her family where a family member a young boy they don't have a father it's just the mother the son and the daughter trying to earn a living on their own and this young man who's in his early 20s for whatever reason whatever money his mother makes he blows it up he is not holding on to a job and uh, <clears throat> so what should you do in such a situation what should the mother do she's got a young son who is behaving in a very irresponsible manner and this was creating a lot of conflict in the family it was creating a lot of distress in the family not just that immediate small family but also the larger family because of this young boy's conduct and how long is the mother supposed to tolerate this kind of conduct and allow the child to be responsible because of her deep attachment she was not willing to take any firm measures so when a person is an adult or has reached adulthood then what we tend to do is we practice this emotional tolerance and allow the situation to just get worse and worse and worse and worse because what is the fear the fear is if i become too harsh with my son is it possible i may drive him to commit suicide what will happen to him will he really learn a lesson or not you know so this kind of very conflicting turmoil type of situation can happen in people's lives so really at that point you have to ask what is dharma dharma is if you are an adult child you have to take responsibility if you are not taking responsibility then certain steps have to be taken to make sure that person wakes up and does the right thing so really at all times in our life we have to ask ourselves 
our decisions that we are making, how are we making those decisions? What is the context behind the decisions that we make? Because you are carrying an emotional handicap with you throughout your life. Because you're unwilling to take the tough decisions when it really matters. So even we can fa face this existential crisis. There are circumstantial crises and there is existential crisis. Circumstantial crises, yes, things will happen in life. You have to learn to deal with it and manage it the best you can. The actual existent, existential crisis is, how do I stop this process of birth, death, old age, and disease? That's the existential crisis. But we've made the circumstantial crisis our existential crisis. It's like we've made that the life and soul of the rest of our life, trying to deal with it. And therefore, you feel like you are just sinking into quicksand. Deeper and deeper and deeper. The more you fight, the more you sink. The more you resist, the more you go deep. So for us in our personal lives, we have to ask ourselves, whatever crisis situation that we may come across, is it really a crisis? Are we making that crisis even worse than what it is? Simply because of our inability to make decisions or our refusal to accept the circumstance? So for us, it's very, very, very important that we know how to handle this. So I will talk, we'll, in another five minutes, I will uh, try and conclude here. So what is Arjuna actually experiencing? He's experiencing a crisis of faith. He's lost faith in himself. How has he lost faith in himself? He's forgotten who he is. He's forgotten he's a Kshatriya. He's forgotten that his duty is to uphold Dharma. And he must uphold Dharma even though that means killing his own family. Because as a Kshatriya, if you're not willing to uphold Dharma, you cannot even call yourself Kshatriya anymore. So although this conflict between Kula Dharma and Kshatriya Dharma is there, for Arjuna. At the very end of the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna says, Sarva Dharma Parityagnya, Maam Ekam Sharanam Braja, Krishna says, Give up all other religions and take my shelter alone. What does that really mean? What Krishna means is when there is a conflict like this, you have a choice between Kula Dharma and Kshatriya Dharma, then you need to worry only about one Dharma alone, which is what pleases me. Which is your Nitya Dharma is what you should worry about. You should not worry about your Swadharma. So when there is a conflict between two Swadharmas, you need to prioritize your Nitya Dharma. Swadharma means doing everything on the basis of your body, right? Relationships, society, etc., etc. It is important. Nitya Dharma means doing everything on the spiritual platform. What is your duty and responsibility as a soul towards the super soul? So when Krishna says give up all religion, he really doesn't mean give up all dharma. What he means is when there is a conflicting situation in your life, when you're not sure which path to take, you should always take the path of Nitya Dharma. Even if that means you have to sacrifice Swadharma. In this case, Arjuna had to prioritize fighting the war not because he wanted to win it and enjoy it. He had to fight the war to please Krishna. So here, pleasing Krishna becomes more important than Arjuna's own emotions. 
That's what Krishna means when he says, Sarva Dharman Paratyakya Maam Ekam Sharanam Vaja. At all times, whatever activities that you undertake, do it as a service to Krishna, not for yourself. So that's how the Bhagavad Gita ends, where Krishna says, if there is a conflict, this is how you should make a decision. So Arjuna has experienced a crisis of faith. You know, when Arjuna realizes that he has to kill his own family members, he begins to question everything. Who am I? What's my purpose in life? Why do I need to kill? So this is the turning point for Arjuna. Because he's confused, he's asking questions, and asking questions is a good sign. It means you're actually thinking. You're using your intelligence. You're trying to decipher the problem. You're trying to figure out how you are supposed to solve this problem. There are other people who just bury their head in the sand and ignore the problem, thinking it will go away. So imagine if we use an alarm clock to wake up in the morning. Some of us, when the alarm goes off, we will not even hear it. So for some of us, when we go through crisis situations, we don't even realize we are in a crisis situation. There are many people like this. They are primarily operating under the mode of ignorance. They don't even realize that they're suffering. They just continue on like nothing is, nothing is wrong because they lack the intelligence. Then some of us will get up, hit the snooze button and go back to sleep. Thinking if the alarm clock is shut off, the problem will go away. I'll wake up a little bit later and it would have gone by then. So some of us think ignoring the problem is going to solve the problem. It's not. So better to always act and make a decision and move on. Then some of us, may have difficulty waking up, but we'll do our best to wake up and start our day. So here, Arjuna has finally woken up. He's asking all the correct questions. What am I supposed to do, Krishna? I'm confused, he tells Krishna. I'm confused. I don't know what is the right thing to do. Please guide me, he tells Krishna. So, the word Dhritarashtra means, Rashtra means land, country. Dhritarashtra means one who usurps another person's property. That's the literal meaning of the word Dhritarashtra. Somebody who takes away someone else's property. The word Duryodhana means, Dhur means bad. Yudh means fighter. Somebody who's a dirty fighter. That's literally the meaning, one of the meanings of the word Dhuryodhana. So Dhritarashtra represents our material desire. See, Dhritarashtra always had this desire that his sons should rule. So Dhritarashtra represents all of our internal material designs. Duryodhana represents actions to fulfill those desires. Any desire that we have, if we want to fulfill it, we have to act on it. Yes. So Dhritarashtra represents material desires. Duryodhana represents material actions. So material motivations give rise to material activities. And the problem is that material activities will ultimately lead to defeat, to disappointment and frustration. There is only so much planning and uh, control that we have over material situations. It is not that one should give up our material desires. 
but one should keep it in context of pleasing Krishna. Not I, me, mine alone. We are entitled to Krishna's property because he is our father. But we should be very careful of, about how much of that property we want for ourselves and deprive our fellow brothers and sisters of the rest. Right? So greed should not be something that drives us. So our happiness today in our life is based on material things. But that is not where we are going to find true happiness. True happiness will come in spirituality. When you practice spirituality, you will experience lasting happiness. Because everything else is temporary. So what do we do if you have a problem in life? It's a little bit of a naughty way of looking at this, I suppose. So the first question I have to ask is, do you have a problem in life? And if the answer is no, then why worry? Do you have a problem in life? If the answer is yes, the next question is, do you have a solution for it? If the answer is yes, you have a solution, then why are you worried? If the answer is, I don't have a solution, then why worry? So anyway, be patient and dependent on Krishna. Because not every problem you can solve on your own. This is very important to keep in mind. That every problem, we can only do so much. The rest, we are completely dependent on Krishna. Krishna has this plan. We, are, we have our plan. We are trying to work on our plan and Krishna is trying to intervene and try to help you and you are trying to push him away. That's our problem. So this is important, is that not to be beset with anxiety. Whatever you can do, you do your best. And the rest, you have to leave it to Krishna. Not to be unduly worried about things that are happening in your life. Take the action that you need to take and leave the rest to Krishna and move on with your life. Don't become paralyzed by situations or events or by people or colleagues. Don't become paralyzed. Have faith in yourself and keep moving forward. Yeah? So I will look at the summary. What did we cover today? This is the summary. We said we covered the acronym for today was doubt, right? So doubt, Dhritarashtra's mindset, fear, partiality, anxiety, hope, Duryodhana's mindset, diplomacy that was concealing a deep inner fear about whether Dronacharya and Bhishma Dev would really do their bit. Ominous signs for the Kauravas that they are going to lose. The battle is happening on a holy land called Kurukshetra. The father of Dharma is there, Lord Krishna. The conch shells that the Pandavas are blowing are called Divyam by Sanjaya. Hanuman's presence is felt, Lakshmi Devi is there. And the chariot given as a benediction by Agni Dev to Arjuna. And then U stands for uncertainty of Arjuna, his hesitation to fight. He becomes bewildered the minute he sees his family, Swarjana, my family. And then all the reasons that he gives as to why he really shouldn't fight, that it is really not worth it. He's feeling compassion. Uh, he's not going to be able to enjoy the kingdom. There's so much destruction. And um, the women will be bereft of husbands, children will be bereft of adults in their life. And everything is going to go bad from here. That was Arjuna's thinking. So how does chapter one end? So chapter one ends with Arjuna saying the following. So, so here we'll read the last two three shlokas. So this is Arjuna speaking. Alas, how strange it is that we're preparing to commit greatly sinful acts. He's using the word we, including Krishna in it, because Krishna is on his side. Driven by the desire to enjoy royal happiness, 
We are intent on killing our own kinsmen. Better for me if the sons of Dhritarashtra, weapons in hand, were to kill me unarmed and unresisting on the battlefield. Again, this is not something that a Kshatriya would ever do. He's saying, I will lay my arms down. Let them kill me. And then Sanjaya said, Arjuna having thus spoken on the battlefield, cast aside his bow and arrows and sat down on the chariot, his mind overwhelmed with grief. So Arjuna is experiencing a great deal of anxiety and grief about what he's supposed to do. And in the process, he's lost his mind. He's lost his sense of who he really is. So the fundamental question is, if you don't know who you are, then you don't know what's your job and responsibility. So I'm going to show you a high level slide that we created. Let me see if I can pull that up. So can you see this? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, Mother, we can. Yes. So every chapter, I'm going to give you a single word summary to remember. So chapter one has 46 verses. We said the first six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita is called Karma Yoga. It really answers the question, who am I? The first chapter is Arjuna Vishada Yoga. And we said the word Vishada means lamentation. So today's single word summary is lamentation. Lamentation because Arjuna has forgotten who he is. So tomorrow when we cover chapter two, Krishna is going to remind Arjuna who he is. Before Krishna can advise him, Krishna has to first remind him, who are you? So Krishna will establish Arjuna's identity tomorrow. Once he establishes identity, you look at what happens in the next chapter. Karma Yoga. Once you have your identity, then Krishna will say, this is your duty that you have to perform. But to perform your job, you need certain skills, you need knowledge. Krishna will say, okay, this is what you need to know to do your job. Okay, if you do your job well, what, what will be the results? Krishna will talk about that in chapter 5. Then he'll talk about meditation in chapter 6. Then he'll begin to talk about himself in the middle section. Who he is, what kind of insurance, he's a boss, no? He's the, he's the person who's uh, going to hire you. Because Krishna will tell in chapter 3 to Arjuna, you come and work for me. Don't work for yourself. So now Arjuna has to make a decision. If I want to work for Krishna, I mean, what kind of insurance policy will he give me? <laughs> what benefits will I get? What will be my compensation package? All these questions will get answered in the middle section of the Bhagavad Gita. So it's an interesting way to really enjoy reading the Bhagavad Gita, when you look at this one word chapter summary, it really helps you understand how the Bhagavad Gita is actually structured in a very logical manner. You see, he forgot his identity. What is Krishna doing? Krishna has to establish identity. Then he has to tell him what's your job responsibility. Then he has to tell him how do you qualify to do this job? What is the minimum qualifications you need? If you do your job well, what's going to be the result? Okay, so who is your boss? I have told you, come and work for me. Who am I? And what kind of benefits you get if you work for me? Krishna has to answer those questions, right? Which is what he's doing in the middle section. He's telling him how you will get the maximum benefits if you come and work for me. You know, what is the manual that we have to follow if we want to please Krishna? What's the contract that you're signing when you decide you want to work for Krishna? What's the contract that you're signing? What guarantees is Krishna going to give you if you work for him? Then when you come to the last 
six chapters, he talks about Prakriti. And then he talks about how he himself is acting as an attorney, giving you advice, sitting as Paramatma within you. He's talking about how you are sitting inside this prison. He's telling you how to get out of this prison. He's giving you the GPS, global positioning system. He's telling you what is the escape plan. And then in chapter 16, he's telling you, you are in this prison. There are two types of personalities in this prison. There are good people and bad people. Learn to associate with good people, avoid bad people. Krishna is telling, these are the characteristics of the good people. These are the characteristics of all the demons. Better you avoid the demons. What's the key to unlock, to go back to the spiritual world? Having faith in me, Krishna says. And then finally, in the last chapter, Krishna says, if nothing else works, I've told you a lot of things over 17 chapters. If nothing else works, just surrender to me. I'll take care of you. Don't worry about if you fight, whether you're going to win, you're going to lose, who's going to die, who's going to be alive. You don't worry about that. I'll take care of it. Okay. So remember, today's single word summary for chapter one is lamentation. We'll look at identity tomorrow. So we'll stop here.